Hi everyone, my name is Julia Donaldson and I'm one of your MCs for Virtual EmberConf 2020. This year things are a little different, but no less exciting. If you haven't yet checked your email, I'll fill you in on some of the details. So in addition to the live stream content, during the conference you can visit meet.ps slash ember on your device for live Q&A, links to transcripts and slides for all of the talks. You can share photos of yourself, of your workspace, of your Tomster socks, and uh, my personal favorite feature, which is sending emojis flying across the screen in real time. There will also be plenty of emoji sending and discussion on the Ember Discord server. I'll be active in the Q&A and on Discord throughout the conference, and I really hope you join me. I can't wait. We have an amazing two days of content scheduled for us, and it's going to be, as always, inspiring, exciting, and fun. See you there. Hello, and welcome to the first ever virtual EmberConf in very strange circumstances. I am here talking to a big empty room. Um, so thank you for everyone for bearing with us. I also want to thank the speakers for having done all the work to make this possible in the first place on very short notice, and thank the community for coming out and making this event a thing at all. Uh, also thank you, Leah, for scrambling last minute and doing an amazing job with the conference, as always. My son, Jonas, was born on January 13th, 2017. A few months later, Leah, the person who makes EmberConf so amazing every year, my life partner and Jonas's mother, and also the person who made virtual EmberConf possible, carried a uh, few month old Jonas onto the stage to give her announcements. I remember feeling very sure that this was the right thing to do, and at the same time, I was nervously watching the audience. Just a few months earlier, we were living a life without children, totally unable to see what was coming around the bend. It was a snowy winter, Donald Trump had just been elected, but Barack Obama was still president. In a lot of ways, we were waiting for everything to change, but not sure what would come next. That period stretched on and on and on. Jonas was over a week late, and we were living in a quiet period, just ready for everything to change in ways we knew we couldn't predict. One of the first things I clearly remember from the first week after Jonas was born was filling out a commemorative form to remember what was happening on the day he was born. There was a section for president, I remember filling out Barack Obama and thinking a lot about it. Um, I was in general not very good at the first child posed photo thing. There's not a lot of smile here, but I was trying really hard. Uh, another engineer at Tilda was pregnant at the same time, and we knew that as business owners, we could do better than the status quo. After reading about the ways in which modern society leaves parents, and especially women, totally alone to, care of their, to take care of their newborn children, we decided to follow the lead of the Babies in the Workplace Institute and establish a policy allowing parents to bring newborn infants to work. We might be running a technology company, but we had a strong conviction that software went beyond the code that we wrote or how we organized our computers to gain a bit of extra productivity. Software fundamentally is a human activity, an activity that we do together as human beings, and we do our best when we support each other. A few years later, we're now on our second group of infants. We've learned a lot, but most of all, what we've learned is that there's more to software than the number of lines of code you write or the number of minutes you're sitting in your chair. I knew that the Ember community valued building together and that we all valued an environment that was focused on sustainability, personal growth, and sharing. As I looked into the audience that day, I was extremely relieved to see happy faces. People in our community wanted to see that there was more to what we did than cool technology and fights over which paradigm is better. What I did not fully expect was the outpouring of support Leah got from people who finally saw themselves in our community's leadership, who saw that mother and community leader not only didn't conflict, but that the two could go hand in hand because there's something inside of us that wants more from open source communities than technology. We want communities that welcome newcomers, communities that support each other, and communities where the members help each other to be our best selves. I will admit, by the way, that I wrote that whole section before the current situation, and it feels all the more relevant right now. <laughs> At the same time as all that was happening, the Ember community was recovering from a rocky transition to the Glimmer rendering engine in Ember 1.13. Uh, 1.13 had a large number of deprecations, and those deprecations were removed just one minor release later. It was uh, technically 2.0. While that se sequence technically followed semantic versioning, it fragmented the ecosystem and created a lot of chaos. 
I'll never forget a conversation I had with a community member who had bet everything on Ember 1.12, pitching Ember to his company on the grounds that it was a stable platform to build on. Then we created a flurry of deprecations and removals, and he just felt embarrassed in front of his peers and frankly betrayed. What we learned from that story is that semantic versioning doesn't tell the whole story of ecosystem stability. We could see that we violated Ember's basic premise, which is everything we do, we do it together, even though we followed the rules of semantic versioning. For the next few years, we invested in strengthening what we could do together as a community. The first RFC that we use, so the RFC process is what we use to make decisions as a community. And the first one that we merged was in 2014, but for a, a long time, we used RFCs only narrowly for features like block params or tweaks to computer property syntax or engines. RFCs gave us a way to make decisions as a community together, and during the 2.x series, after that 1.13 debacle, we refined the RFC process and expanded its footprint to virtually every decision we would make as a framework. By the time Ember 3.0 rolled around, we had refined the RFC process so it could be used for every decision we needed to make. We also came to understand how decisions guided by RFCs are better decisions. First and foremost, RFCs are tools to help us make decisions. The final decision is always in the hands of the core team that is responsible for the area covered by the RFC. The primary rule is that decisions of, of a core team must be made entirely on the basis of comments made or summarized on the RFC thread. Once the conversation reaches a steady state and participants aren't bringing any new information to the table, the relevant core team is prepared to make a decision. They declare a final comment period, which is a last call for comments before they make a decision. Typically, if new information comes up during the final comment period, the core team will continue the discussion instead of proceeding. In short, the ultimate and primary purpose of the RFC process is to aid members of the core teams in making decisions with the benefit of as many perspectives as possible. Second, RFCs help core teams collect constraints from the community. By building up a collection of constraints, the core teams can arrive at decisions that better satisfy a broader cross-section of the community. Third, RFCs help those involved in an RFC build relationships. Those relationships often last into the implementation phase of the process and often even longer. In fact, it's some of my favorite stories from Ember come from people who, who found each other through RFC threads. In some cases, small communities spring up around RFCs, which sometimes turn into strike teams that work on implementation. The ad hoc nature of these relationships is a strength of this structure. RFCs provide just enough structure to get a conversation going, but don't have much to say about the work style of the participants. This really comes in handy as we press RFCs into service to do more, as I will talk about soon. Fourth, RFCs help drive a design discussion to completion and then provides a structure for implementation. By the time an RFC is merged, the implementation is either already complete or a small community have, has sprung up around it to drive it to completion. Just as the RFC process is a tool to help core teams make decisions, it is a tool to drive discussions to completion. An RFC process that allows never-ending discussion is failing at this goal. Fifth, RFCs record the rationale and constraints for decisions that the core team makes. Later, when people wonder why a decision was made, a complete record of the final rationale for this decision, as well as a record of the discussion, is available for inspection. This really comes in handy when the original rationale for a decision is no longer applicable. For example, a design decision based on a quirk of IE8. If the IE8 is no longer around, that decision is free to be revisited. Finally, and perhaps the most important, RFCs give people in the community a chance to feel heard, and I really do mean perhaps the most important. We learned this lesson after 1.13. When community members don't feel heard, it usually means we're not really listening. This undermines the legitimacy of the process, and it also undermines everything else we hope to achieve with RFCs. A core team may be able to technically make decisions when people don't feel heard, but it is unlikely to collect all the constraints. Community, community members who don't feel heard don't build relationships around an RFC. Community members who don't feel heard continue to fight during the implementation phase and are unlikely to provide their expertise and assistance to get the feature over the finish line. This imperils the project's completion and community members who don't feel heard won't consider the recorded history legitimate, reducing the force of the project's history. So fundamentally, a successful RFC will make community members feel heard, even if they don't ultimately agree with the final decision of the core team. So we realized that RFCs were a general purpose decision-making tool that could help us make decisions, build communities around those decisions, and drive them to completion. And we started to ask ourselves, given that definition of RFCs, why shouldn't we use RFCs for more things? In 2018, our community was using Slack, but we were quickly outgrowing it. Slack's free plan, which we were using, capped archives at 10,000 messages, and we had to manually manage users. The framework team thought that we should move to Discord, but we knew it would only work if we really gave the whole community a chance to flesh out the plan with us and really buy into it. 
when we thought about it, we realized that is exactly a job for RFCs. We had iterated a lot on the RFC template over the years so, so that it more closely matched the goals of fleshing out and mobilizing around a proposal, and it worked really well. We even had a how do we teach this section. For this RFC, because it was the first time we used it for something like this, we were paying a lot of attention to the need to ultimately wind down the conversation and make a decision. There were 164 comments on the thread before we finally wrapped up the conversation, and the conversation helped refine the RFC and helped refine the policy around which rooms would be limited to users with certain roles, for example. Precisely because of the need to make a decision that we could all support, it was imperative that participants in the conversation felt heard. I was so proud of the way our community handled this discussion. The final comment uh, that approved this RFC was a comment by Tom. And I think this comment by Tom really shows what it looks like when a spirited conversation has slowed down and is ready to start driving towards a conclusion. So for example, Tom says, after several long discussions based on the concerns raised above, we still think Discord is the right next step and intend to merge this RFC. We do this with the awareness that this is not the preferred outcome for many people. This was before final comment period, which would have made more sense for this statement. And I really like this sentiment, sentiment from Tom. Ember is its community, not its code base. Preserving the health of this community is my number one priority. A sincere thank you to everyone who commented on this RFC for or against. Decisions like this are not easy, but I believe this is the right thing to do for the long-term health of Ember. And then the real test. This was an incredibly hard stress test of the RFC process. It lasted about six months from the time it was opened until the time it was merged, and it got 164 comments. Ultimately, we believe that by doing the work to respect each other and sincerely hear each other out, we are creating a strong, healthy community that can go farther together. And this, this uh, comment says, this is not the decision I personally favor, but I appreciate that someone has to make a decision. That is the, that is the best case scenario for everybody felt heard, even though we don't all agree. Now, if you think that moving to Discord is a tricky RFC, this next one is even trickier. Um, Ember's website is the home base for many of our developers, and it hasn't changed in years. And we kept hearing over and over again that it's time for us to update the website. But as much as everyone felt strongly that it was time for a big update, members of the community had very strong opinions about how it should change. And having done a lot of design work in my day myself, there was no way in hell I wanted to subject a designer to the kind of back and forth asynchronous discussion that the RFC process uses to drive decisions. There's nothing wrong with that process, it's just not really the process that a designer is used to going through. So what we needed to do is create a small strike team of community members who would work directly with the designer and represent the designer's perspective to the community and vice versa. It was pretty tricky to navigate, but it was an important test of our capacity to make decisions as a community without a corporation's management hierarchy calling the shots and without the need for a benevolent dictator for life. I don't want to do that. The RFC contained designs and illustrations, so it was a pretty different kind of RFC. As the RFC progressed, the designs were tweaked and refined. To try to get as much community perspective into the first draft as possible, we analyzed our annual community survey and identified the values that those who responded to the survey described. This is one piece of that analysis, but there, attached to the RFC was a PDF with a very detailed analysis of what kind of values um, came through in the survey. And people should check it out. Um, now, as soon as we released the RFC, the RFC re revealed a gr glaring oversight. In our effort to streamline the visual design, we had taken away something that Ember developers felt was a core part of their identity. Looks great, the only thing I'm missing is not seeing a Tomster anywhere on that page, wink. This turned out to be a critical discussion. Leia was very careful not to overwhelm the designer, and soon enough, the designer popped in to give us a status update. And when all was said and done, we found a way to keep around Ember's iconic illustrations while still refreshing the visual style of the website. Ultimately, because of the magnitude of this project, this RFC was co-owned by the framework core team, the learning team, and the steering committee. It was approved by all three groups, and its implementation was managed by the learning team. If you go to emberjs.com today, you can see the fruits of this labor. Just like the Discord RFC, because we were doing something like this for the first time, we were experimenting with using the RFC process to work together as a community to do something really outside the realm of Ember APIs. We paid close attention to the need to make final decisions, especially because we were working with a designer who was not directly involved with the RFC process itself. We were also very focused on making sure that the plan could be implemented by the learning team, and a lot of the thread is about that, and ultimately finished. And just like with the Discord RFC, we knew that making sure that everyone felt heard was critical to marshalling the kind of effort that we would need to implement the website at the end. It is also worth noting that in addition to the number of people who raised concerns about losing our iconic illustration style, 
the RFC process also unearthed another constraint, accessibility. The learning team was already waist deep in an effort to improve the overall accessibility of the website, and this new homepage needed to continue to build on that effort. Now, the reason that most people wouldn't even consider updating the website through the RFC process is fear of the dreaded design by committee. I remember in my very first web development job being told to put a counter at the bottom of the page. I said, what's the point of that? Very few people actually go to this website. Wouldn't that be very embarrassing? To which I was told, don't be silly. Did you think we wanted you to put the real count of views there? That's what design by committee looks like, and it's a disaster. In this case, we weren't using the design process to iterate granularly with the designer. We would never ever use the RFC process to do something that looks like design by committee. Instead, we were using the RFC process to help the leadership of the project make decisions that were well-informed, recorded, implementable, and which made members of the community feel heard. We've also invested in giving people a path to join the core teams, provided they are willing and able to do the work. This has always been an extremely important part of Ember's community focus. Our goal and our yardstick is this. Our core teams should represent communities, companies big and small, big, medium, and small, countries all over the world, and people with many different perspectives and identities. The more diverse our leadership teams are, the more likely their decisions will reflect, will reflect the wider community, and the more likely it is that the wider community will reflect those decisions, will respect those decisions. And the core teams have a place for people doing all kinds of different work. Designers, event planners, project managers, and illustrators are all part of Ember's community leadership team. With the completion of the Discord and website RFCs, our community process had proven itself. It had become a general purpose tool for helping us organize discussion, drive towards decisions, and mobilize implementation. We didn't need a single corporation to make decisions for us through its management hierarchy, and we didn't need to vest all decision-making authority in a single person to move faster, no matter how benevolent that person might be. We had learned to move together. These RFCs also proved that we can do the work together and still make progress. It reminds me of the adage, go slow to go fast. I found that if you try to blow past community dissent and make command decisions, you're taking on community debt that will crop up randomly later on. Because at the end of the day, Ember's core belief is that we're all in this together, through ups and downs, through thick and thin, through coronavirus or whatever. We're all willing to work as hard for each other as we work for ourselves. And that means continuing to build the capacity to work together. But trouble was lurking. While we were investing our energy in building the, bringing the community together, by 2017, the Ember framework felt like it was starting to fall behind. In Ember, moving as a community is our highest technical priority. At the beginning, that meant that our users had to wait for the community to design new high-level features to make progress. This slows down enthusiastic early adopters in our community. It also deprives us of the feedback of experiments. So to get our community to experiment more, maybe we could announce features that are still just ideas. Then our community could help us flesh them out and help us figure out what the problems are. This is not a solution for Ember. It places too much of the onus of experimentation on the people who are just trying to ship new features and make progress with their apps and who are not excited about taking the time to experiment at work. What we realize is that for every nine people who are just going about their day, building features and making their customers happy, there's about one person who is excited about trying out new stuff either because they really, really need it, or more likely that they're just the kind of person who likes tinkering with new stuff. This reminded me of a talk that Brandon Hayes gave called Surviving the Framework Wars. He said there are three kinds of people in a community, and they correspond to three different stages of development in a community. He, he cited um, somebody. The link is on this slide. Pioneers are, so pioneers are responsible for the early vision of the project and for doing the experimental work that gets it off the ground, Brandon said. Settlers are responsible for long-term strategy and synthesis, and town planners are responsible for tactics and execution. By the way, depending on the day, I personally might be a pioneer, like when I'm working on Glimmer VM features, a settler when I'm working on Skylight, or a town planner when I'm attending framework meetings. I actually think it's very important to be able to conceive of people moving seamlessly across these roles. What we realized when we thought about it is that in our ideal community, the people who are excited to experiment with new features can play around, and in that ideal community, that wouldn't disrupt everybody else. And every so often, when this is going well, the excited experimenters share the love by creating add-ons that the rest of the community can use. We've seen this happen over and over with Fastboot, Mirage, Ember Twiddle, Ember Observer, TypeScript support, and so much more. Even without our direct support, 
the kinds of people who are excited about experimenting with new tools, bring new stable features to the rest of the user base in the form of add-ons. On its own, the pioneers do an amazing job of fleshing out experimental ideas, finding problems, suggesting solutions, and creating add-ons for users. But what we realized around 2017 is that the core teams could make their job even easier by changing our process. Instead of the core teams fully designing high-level features, landing the whole feature behind a feature flag, and then stabilizing it over time, we could involve the pioneers directly. We could instead land and stabilize low-level features that we did not intend every day users to use. And we could let the pioneers hammer on them to flesh out high-level APIs. The key is to make sure that Ember settlers see all the activity, but understand that they're free to continue doing their everyday work while the pioneers chart the next course. There's a certain joy in embracing the idea that you're getting your work done, and you don't need to be a part of every little twist and turn of the effort of the pioneers. Starting in 2017, we started learning how to make a process out of shipping features as low-level primitives first and let the pioneers flesh out the high-level APIs. We fleshed out the idea in our 2017 keynote, the same year that we announced Glimmer.js. Now, Glimmer.js was our first serious attempt to chart this course, and let's just say we learned from that experience. By 2018, we had become fluent in the idea. When we wrote the routing service RFC, we had the basics down. And by 2019, with the, with the modifier manager API, we had become pretty confident that the approach was working. By then, we had years of experience shipping new features, first as low-level primitives, and saw that Ember settlers could keep humming along just fine. This quote is basically saying in the RFC, we're not very worried about fragmentation. We've done this a bunch of times, and everything is humming along just fine. And in practice, let's look at how that worked. So the visit API becomes Fastboot. Component Manager becomes Glimmer Component. And Modifier Manager became Ember Modifiers. The key is that when we ship new APIs like Component Manager or Modifier Manager, we focus on unlocking experimentation and flexibility, and we use names that clearly communicate that application developers don't need to look at them now. They also need to tend to be designed with an eye towards evolution. These low-level APIs tend to be much more stable than higher-level APIs, which means that the experiments that people build in user space continue to work even when we eventually finalize something else in core. We give the pioneers the tools that they need to pioneer and leave the settlers alone to settle. Now, a totally valid alternative to this story is to announce new APIs while they're, while they're still being designed and encourage everyone in the community to participate in the process of fleshing them out. That gives the whole community, including the settlers, a QA role, and it probably uncovers more information. But it cuts against Ember's core value, placing too much of the onus of building new features on Ember's settlers. At first, this was a serious issue for us because our pioneers had nothing to do unless they were able to contribute directly to Ember source code. But since 2017, we have focused on community innovations that would give Ember's pioneers a lot to do, improving how quickly we could build new features without creating the kind of fragmentation that cuts so deeply against our core value that everything we do, we do together. By 2019, we had gotten pretty good at this. Our pioneers were cranking out new add-ons left and right, and Ember's core teams were focused on building low-level primitives so they could work with the pioneers to build the next generation high-level features. There was only one problem. Most Ember users had no idea when they should adopt any of these features. In some cases, the features had gone through the entire life cycle, from primitive to pioneer to stability. In other cases, features were still going through the life cycle. While this was moving Ember along technically, it was obvious that it wasn't the end of the story. We had one more life cycle problem to solve, and for Ember, it's the whole ballgame. How could we move our community to the new world that we were building together? So in last year's keynote, we announced the last piece of community innovation puzzle. The last piece of the community innovation puzzle, additions. Ember Octane would be the first edition. An addition serves as a call to arms to the community's pioneers. It's time to turn a collection of features into a new world that we can migrate our entire community to. In the meantime, the settlers keep on working. They can see all the exciting work going on to get everyone ready to migrate to a new, better world, and some may even find it exciting enough to do some pioneering of their own. But most people continue to get their job done day in and day out and wait for the call to march together. Although Jen Weber couldn't be in Portland in person this year, she created an Octane trailer for us to watch. Let's roll the tape. Today's presentation has a lot of information for and about our community, but it's also a time to share a message with the broader JavaScript community. Is Ember is a front-end framework that has something new to offer you, a new set of tools and a new way of working on web apps. Our latest work is called Ember Octane, and it's a total overhaul of Ember syntax, mental models, and learning journey. If you tried Ember before, 
This is pretty different. One of Ember's long-standing core strengths is that it includes the things you need to build a successful software product, tools that are built to work together. Now with Octane, it puts HTML first. It puts components front and center. Developers can learn by following thoroughly tested, free, brand new tutorials. And this past December, we shipped Octane in a minor, stable release, building some of the best new features that the front end has to offer on top of a solid, dependable foundation. Ember developers didn't have to rewrite their apps in order to start using these features. Let me take you on a tour. With a few commands, I can generate my app, install and use almost any popular JavaScript package from NPM, and add some markup, interaction, and CSS. I can write some end-to-end -end tests, run them, run a production build, and deploy. I can do all of these things with zero config. Along the way, I learned some important things in a guided way. Out of the box, every new Ember app comes with linting that guides me to make good choices for following coding best practices and improving my app's accessibility. And when I work on other projects, I bring my knowledge and expertise about the web with me. Here, I'm copying and pasting some D3 code I found on the internet into my Ember app. In the end, I have more time for doing the things I enjoy as a developer. Whenever I have questions, it's especially helpful to be part of this community. I can get debugging help from other people without needing to explain my app's architecture first. The Ember community includes developers who work at companies that have thousands of engineers. They work at small startups with scrappy teams and the drive to build something new. They're hobbyists who choose Ember for their side project because it lets one person get a lot done. And anyone can participate in shaping Ember's future by making proposals for new features or providing feedback on the things that others have written. We're all using the same core tools and that opens new possibilities. If you need to move quickly to get your app into production, or you want to learn what it takes to get there, we invite you to try Ember Octane. Let's build something together. We spent a lot of time talking about how Ember, have, how Ember has improved its capacity to move together as a community, and we w just watched Jen quickly walk through Octane. But now I want to take a few minutes to rewind back to 2005 and talk about my own journey from print designer to programmer. When I started programming in 2005, I already knew HTML and CSS, sort of. At the time, I had five years of experience as editor-in-chief and main designer of two school newspapers. My designs had won some minor awards, and I had learned enough HTML and CSS to lightly modify the CMS that my newspaper used to put its content on the internet. This is a, this is a not fully complete comp that I found in my email from back then. When I took my first job as a web designer, I assumed that my experience as a print designer would carry me forward as I found my digital footing. The person who hired me had the same assumption. Virtually all of my jobs before this one were low paid hourly work. This web designer job paid $37 an hour, but it was part time, 20 hours a week. Still, it was a living wage at a respected nonprofit. On my first day at the job, I was told that the company had cut ties with the digital agency that had been managing the websites of a dozen or so departments and expected me to take over the responsibilities effective immediately as a half-time employee. I was hanging on for dear life. For my first project, I updated the website for the nonprofit's annual dinner. It was a Cold Fusion website. Next, I built a brand new microsite for a basketball tournament fundraiser, then a golf tournament microsite. In the meantime, demands from half a dozen departments were piling up. They had replaced a digital agency with a half-time employee whose only web experience was Microsoft front page. I was only supposed to work half-time, but my desk was piled high with requests to make changes to various parts of the organization's website, requests for brand new microsites, and requests for meetings to discuss and plan even more websites. I frequently worked 30 or even 40 hours a week just to keep up with the most urgent demands. I realized that my print design experience wasn't gonna get the job done. I needed to learn how to program, and I needed to learn fast. I remember walking into Barnes & Noble, going into the programming section, and feeling like the information I needed was somewhere inside the books on those shelves. I didn't have a ton of extra money at the time, but I picked up a PHP and MySQL book, and I read it cover to cover. I felt a great sense of relief. This was going to work. I already knew HTML and CSS, and I was going to be able to use PHP to speed up my work. I could, spot, I could stop spending hours keeping headers and footers up to date. I could give people in the organization a tiny form they could use to update frequently changing copy on the website. It made a huge difference. 
I was still copying and pasting PHP files from the last project into the new one when I created a new microsite, but the structure really helped. That didn't mean I suddenly had a lot of free time. I was still totally new to programming and the requests were coming in fast and furious. It's just that I was now getting things done and I wasn't totally embarrassed by the pace. Then I learned about Rails. Instead of including the header and footer into every page, Rails had the concept of layouts. I remember thinking that layouts were so much better. I could take the HTML and CSS I was writing in PHP files, move them into a Rails app, and everything got better. Instead of ad hoc forms where people could edit tiny pieces of copy, I could finally build the CMS backend I always dreamed of, always for a few months. Uh, this is an image from about a year later when I turned it into a Rails plugin. To be honest, I was probably a little bit in over my head at the time, but I actually did build the CMS for the departments in the organization to use, just a few months after realizing that I actually needed to be a programmer, not a designer. What made all that possible, and the reason I'm a programmer today, is that when I was in over my head, barely hanging on, I was able to build on the baseline knowledge of HTML and CSS a little bit at a time, never having to build, burn weeks of time at work on learning a whole new paradigm. Frankly, if I had tried to learn a new paradigm, I would have probably have been fired and looking for a new print design job before I could ever become a programmer. So this is very personal to me. I wouldn't be a programmer today if I hadn't found tools that took my HTML and CSS knowledge and helped me build on it. Here's what I'm talking about. There's basically three steps. You want to get your, portfo your portfolio, your marketing website, or your personal website online. Create a new app, you want to take your HTML and CSS, and you want to deploy it. And you want space to grow into a dynamic website with dynamic URLs as you learn more. And you don't want an easy bake oven. You don't want tools that only beginners use. You want tools that everybody uses. I'm talking about using tools that a community of professional web developers use to build large applications with hundreds of engineers. In 2005, what I needed was a way to incrementally supercharge my HTML and CSS skills. And this is something that has always weighed heavily on me. I personally built HTML tokenization, parsing and tree building infrastructure into Glimmer VM, and we have worked extremely hard to support valid HTML, including SVG. Here's an example test if you don't believe me. Um, you might not believe me because SVG is, very, is the bane of everyone's existence. Even though we cared a lot about this use case and kept pushing Ember towards being a great fit for people who already know HTML and, HTML and CSS, there was already one major stumbling block. There was always one major stumbling block. Ember required users to configure the root element of every component using a weird JavaScript DSL. To be honest, even though we had done so much work to align Ember with HTML, I didn't feel like the Yehuda of 2005 would have been able to bootstrap a programming career with Ember. And yet, it wasn't like there were a lot of other options out there for that person. What's really incredible to me is that the Octane programming model has enough improvements that we could update the documentation to teach components HTML first. The picture on the right is an example that we first introduced in the first section which is called templates or HTML and used throughout the guides. And this is the first place in the component guides where JavaScript comes up at all. In isolation, each feature of Octane might seem small, but in aggregate, they make enough of a difference to change the way we write Octane apps. And if we change the way we write Octane apps, of course, we need to do it together. And that's why we refreshed the guides based on this new way of teaching and using Ember components before we were ready to call the whole community to migrate to the new world. And we could finally, and with enthusiasm, tell all of our users about the work that we had done to bake HTML so deeply into the Glimmer VM. Going back to the beginning, this means that if you know HTML and CSS, you can take your existing code, drop it into an Ember application, deploy it quickly to production, and share it with your friends. This goes for Tom's World of Warcraft Guild website, which is the first website Tom made as a programmer. It goes for my basketball tournament website, and it goes for your portfolio or marketing website. And you can iterate on your skills, just like I did with PHP and Rails, to add interactivity to your website. Godfrey is gonna get into a lot more details about what it looks like technically, about what HTML first looks like technically, but this is the goal. And once you get your website on the internet, which is really the important thing, it's important that you have something on the internet that you can share with your friends, or, your, or a potential boss, or a potential person you're applying for a job at. There's room to grow. You could add interactivity using the component JavaScript API. You can add more pages to your app with the Ember router. You can add server-side rendering using Fastboot or even Empress to build on your Ember knowledge to build a Jamstack app, which there will be a talk about in this conference. And my personal favorite is you can use Airtable as a backend to add some dynamic data to your app. 
The coolest thing about Airtable is that after you design your tables, you get custom documentation that's localized for the exact table and columns that you created. You can just copy and paste it into your application. And if you're feeling really adventurous, you could try it in Broider, which brings automatic route-based code splitting to your app. It works today, and a lot of real-world apps already work with Embroider, but not every add-on supports Embroider yet. Ember's pioneers are hard at work to bring Embroider to everyone, which means that all Ember apps will soon have route-based code splitting without any special annotations just by using Ember's router and components normally. If you fancy yourself a pioneer, try it out. It's really cool. <laughs> Whether you're just starting out with an HTML and CSS in your pocket and dreams of becoming a web developer, or whether you're a pioneer looking to help chart the course to embroider for the rest of the community, Ember has a place for you. And if you're looking to become a part of Ember's leadership, there's a team to shoot for, regardless of your skill or prior experience with framework code. If you have experience with infrastructure, writing, or web development, the learning team would love your help. If you love project management and want to put those skills to good use, reach out. You don't need to be a wizard at framework development or have an interest in becoming one to have a path to leadership in Ember. If you're interested, reach out to a member of the steering committee, framework team, or learning team, and one of us will try to help you figure out what your path might look like. Ultimately, what I have learned being a part of this amazing community is that there's much more to web, develop, web frameworks than code. We strive together, we're ambitious together, we move together. And now, when the only way to stay safe is to distance ourselves from one another, we need each other more than ever. For posterity, I want to bring Jonas up on the stage one more time. <laughs> Roll the tape. Okay, I made an antibody with a head on it. You painted an antibody? Yeah. That's great. What's your antibody going to do? It's going to go track down the small virus. Oh, what's it going to do if it finds a virus? It's going to track it down. And then what's it going to do? It's going to stop it. It's going to stop it? That's great. And then you'll be healthy? Yeah. That's so good. What a great antibody. As they used to say when I was growing up, from your lips to God's ears, kid. Next up, Godfrey is going to do a deeper dive into the technical details of Octane. But first, let's watch, let's watch Jen's trailer again, because it's so cool. I am done here. I am going to step away from the podium. Thank you, Jen and Yehuda, and hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Virtual Ember Conf 2020. I'm Godfrey from the Ember team, and I'm here to give you an update on all the exciting things that happened this year in the Ember world. Of course, as you probably noticed at this point, the most important news of all is that we shipped Octane, a new edition of Ember. But what exactly is Octane? As you saw in Jen's trailer, Octane is a lot of things. It's a major update to the framework, it's a set of new features, it's new programming model, it's new defaults when generating apps, it's a new set of recommendations and linting rules, it has a new website, updated documentation, blah, blah. 
Sure, it's all of those individual things, but above all, Octane is really an opportunity for us to present Ember to developers outside of our community. It's a chance for us to say, hey, we have made a lot of improvements to Ember and we think you really like it. Based on the feedback we received so far, I think uh, it's probably safe to say we deliver on that. Believe it or not, we actually got an entire page of positive reviews on Hack News, but you didn't see that coming. Um, for a lot of us existing Ember users though, things might feel a little bit different. Sure, we hear a lot of things about Octane on the internet, there are a lot of new things, but hey, we have an app to maintain at work and it's not like we're going to rewrite everything overnight. That's the whole point of using Ember after all, it's about the stability, right? Well, we totally get that and that's why we focus a lot on incrementalism and backwards compatibility. We ship and stabilize these features incrementally whenever they're ready. There's no breaking changes. We also make sure there's a good interrupt story between a new and old paradigms. We think this is a pretty good time to upgrade overall, but, um, and if you want to do that, we have written code mods and other migration tools to help with that. But ultimately the choice is yours and your existing code is not gonna suddenly stop working anytime soon. That's all great, but because things are so incremental and so backwards compatible, for a lot of us em longtime Ember users, we're mostly focused on the mechanics. Like, what switches do I have to flip to upgrade my app? What is the transition path from A to B? Things like that. These things are of course very important, but they can also cause you to miss the forest for the trees. When you're so focused on the mechanics, you might miss the bigger picture and don't fully realize how different things really are. So for the purpose of this segment, I want to invite you to go ahead and forget everything you know about Ember for now, and let's try to give Ember a fresh look from the perspective of a new user. I'm going to highlight three major areas of Octane that I think are pretty representative, and through these examples, I hope to show you the many ways that we are now thinking about um, these features differently in the post-Octane era of Ember. So, here we go. As you should have mentioned from the beginning, Ember positioned itself as a framework for building ambitious web applications. At the core of the web platform, there's HTML and there's CSS. So at the core of the Ember framework is just HTML and CSS. We want to embrace the web platform and empower web developers to build on top of these familiar foundation technologies and be able to do more with them rather than getting in your way and requiring you to learn something completely new and different. If you already know HTML and CSS, you should really be able to dive right in into the world of Ember and feel right at home here. This has always been a goal of Ember, and in fact, this is the reason Ember was born in the first place as a fork of Sprout Core that focuses more on an HTML first approach. However, historically, there have always been some accidental, shall we say, annoyances, both big and small, that kind of gets in the way and undermine our position here. A big part of Octane is to clean up these complexities. Let me show you some examples. When creating a new Octane app, you can go straight into your index template, plop down some HTML, some CSS, and bam, everything just works the way you expect. This means you can drop in any markup you find on the internet, maybe from Stack Overflow, or perhaps some mockups that you receive from a designer without making any special modification or tweaks to use them in Ember. Uh, it even works with things like SVG and web components. You can keep your typical web development workflow, such as using a browser's built-in DOM inspector, and there are mo no more strange Ember wrapper elements that messes with your CSS anymore. This may seem like a small change on its own, but it's a good example of the kind of HTML and CSS first experience that we aspire to provide. As you will see, Octane is all about making these steps that seem small by themselves, but when taken together, they add up to more than just the sum of uh, the parts. Speaking of CSS, you can look forward to tomorrow's session and Ember Dev's Guide to CSS Grid. By embracing HTML and CSS, we can immediately take advantage of and benefit from the web platform's latest and greatest features such as CSS Grid without having to reinvent the wheel and like invent a new library or patterns to import these ideas into Ember World. Um, check that out tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. The time is subject to change, so check the schedule for the latest time on these talks. Okay, 
So we have seen that HTML works exactly the same way that you would expect them to in Ember. That's cool, but of course, HTML and CSS alone is not sufficient to build an ambitious application. Otherwise, Ember probably doesn't need to exist at all. Instead, um, we don't want to fight or replace HTML. We want, to, we want Ember to feel like a natural extension of HTML instead. With Octane, I think we've got something that feels pretty great here. One of the limitations of HTML is that it doesn't give you a whole lot of tools to organize your code. Back to our example here, you can see that there are a lot of markup on this page, but if you look at the render output, it's pretty clear that there are some high-level groupings that would be helpful to reflect in the source code. It would be great if you can look at the source code and at a glance kind of know what the render page looks like, or at least what are the important parts of the page are. In Octane, this is pretty easy. All you have to do is create a new template file in the components directory, move over your section of markup, and that's it. The output looks exactly the same as before, but you have just created a component to encapsulate this whole navbar section of your markup. By separating out these logical units and giving them meaningful names, your source code is now much more readable. That's not the end of the story, though. As you can see, at the, bottom of the, at the bottom half of the page, we have a couple of these cards, each representing a different rental property on the site. So while they all have the same visual and markup structure, the information they present is different. We could just copy and paste this markup every time we need it in one of these, but as you have probably experienced, this is going to become a maintenance nightmare very soon, especially in an ambitious code base. Don't worry though, we got you covered here too. Just like before, we can extract the markup into a new component by moving them into a new file. However, instead of hard coding the information, we can replace them with placeholders using the curly braces and add syntax. These placeholders are called component arguments. When invoking the component, we can use the same add syntax to pass these arguments into the component, filling in the placeholders we defined earlier. Now, you have created a parameterized component that can be reused in different parts of your app just by passing different arguments in different situations. You can think of this as giving you the ability to create abstractions in HTML. In a traditional programming language, you are probably, you're probably going to take for granted the ability to split things up into functions. They allow you to break up your code into small, self-contained, and reuse reusable pieces that can be glued together to build something more complicated. Components in Octane give you the same ability to do, to do the same thing with your markup. It doesn't stop here though. Octane gives you a complete suite of tools to, in order to become a productive, ambitious markup developer. For example, we added support for component namespacing, which allow you to group related components into folders and invoke them using the double colon syntax. The splash build feature, on the other hand, allows you to pass arbitrary HTML attributes to your components, which comes in handy when you need to tailor the CSS classes or um, the ARIA attributes for a particular usage of that component. Likewise, you can also pass content around with blocks and yield keyword, and soon you will even be able to pass multiple name blocks when invoking a component. Of course, we have always supported control flows like conditional, if, unless, and loops like each. And soon, there will be a built-in logical operator that you can use without needing to install a separate add-on. Speaking of which, of course, uh, we shouldn't forget that Ember gives you access to a vast component library via add-ons maintained by the community, as well as the ability to package up your own components to share with the world. All in all, Octane, in Octane, we have set out to create, um, to complete our vision of being an HTML first framework, creating a flavor of enhanced HTML that works for building ambitious web applications. And I think we did a pretty good job on that front. You may also have noticed that up until this point, we have not written or discussed any JavaScript just yet. This is not a coincidence. Historically, JavaScript is a pretty integral part to the Ember component model. In fact, it is probably fair to say that before Octane, Ember components were first and foremost JavaScript driven. There was always a JavaScript class associated with each component, and there is a wrapper element owned by the JavaScript class. 
the wrapper element was configured using a JavaScript DSL, and the JavaScript class itself was responsible for intercepting and handling user interactions with the component. Um, to a lot of Ember developers, this JavaScript API is probably the first thing that comes into mind when thinking about components in Ember. In fact, some components don't even need a template in that old world because all customizations were done entirely using JavaScript. In Octane, we flipped it the other way around. Hopefully, I have convinced you that components in Octane are first and foremost driven by HTML and template. As we just saw, this is a pretty viable programming model and in a lot of use cases, a template is all you need in Octane. Gone is the wrapper element and what you see in your components template is what you would get in the DOM. If you want to add a class or if you want to add an HTML attribute, all you need to do is add in a template, no more JavaScript DSL. We have refactored the internals of the rendering engines to remove the need for a JavaScript class when rendering a component. In Octane, when rendering a template-only component, Ember no longer generates and allocate a component instance. And for the most part, this is a pretty subtle change that happens under the hood, but you may notice it from the improved performance and not having access to the special this object in a template-only component. More importantly though, this is a significant mental model shift in how we think about components in Ember. Now, components are all about the template, and any JavaScript you add is secondary to that. To reflect this shift, we have moved the component templates in your app from the templates folder into the main component folder and adjusted the generator's default output accordingly. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're mostly focused on giving Ember a fresh look here. If you want to see more of the how the past compares to the present, you can look forward to Shishida's talk later today. Okay. So even though templates get you pretty far in Octane, we still love JavaScript and we're still a JavaScript framework after all and you're still going to need plenty of it. It's just that JavaScript now plays a pretty different role and serves a different purpose in Octane. In Octane, the primary purpose of JavaScript has switched from managing the DOM to managing data. First, um, for general purpose computation that you plan to reuse across the app, you can use helpers for that. Nothing really changed here in Octane except due to the increased utility of template-only components, I think you may find more places in your app where creating a helper feels like the right choice. It's also worth mentioning that helpers, and including class-based helpers, now participate in the auto-tracking system, which I'll go into a little bit more later. But what about integrating JavaScript into components? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's look at an example. Here we have a share button component that allows the user to share the current page on Twitter. This component, um, this is the component with its markup and for the most part it's just a hyperlink. Twitter has this intent API that lets you prompt the user to compose a tweet just by linking them to a special URL and you can customize the suggested tags and the hashtags using query parameters and stuff like that. While the functionality of the component is very simple, it's just a link after all, you will probably need to write some JavaScript code to build up this special URL, especially when you want to make these things customizable via um, passed in component arguments, and you'll need to also URL encode the query params. So uh, you can probably accomplish this with a series of helpers, but it will probably feel pretty clumsy and it's probably not super appropriate to add a bunch of specialized helpers globally just for a single component. So this is the perfect kind of use case for adding JavaScript class to a component, and with Octane, that's pretty easy too. You can accomplish this by creating a JavaScript file in the same place next to your template, and this is what the code, lo uh, the code looks like. Just as we spend a lot of attention making Octane templates feel like a natural extension of HTML, the same amount of effort went into making sure our JavaScript API leverages native JavaScript syntax, features, and idioms. Here we have a share button component class subclassing from Glimmer component. In our component class, we have access to pass in arguments via this.args, which we took advantage of in our share URL getter. Um, since we added a JavaScript file to our component, we now have access to the 
um, component instance via a special this object in the template. And since we made share URL a getter, it behaves just like any other property on the component instance, so accessing curly curly this.share URL just works in the template. All of these are done using native JavaScript features and we didn't have to make any special annotations to make it work in Ember. I hope you will agree with me that this feels totally in line with modern JavaScript and nothing about it jumps out as weird Emberism. When it comes to integrate JavaScript, integrating JavaScript into the DOM, the challenge has always been about keeping the DOM output in sync with the JavaScript code um, or the JavaScript state. While it may not be super surprising that you have access to this.url, the getter, uh, this.share URL, the getter in the template, um, the surprising thing here is that whenever the pass in arguments changes, Ember will know to rerun your getter and automatically update the DOM output. So in this case, if um, this.args.text changes, Ember is going to recompute your share URL getter and automatically update the href attribute in the DOM. We didn't have to write anything like ember.get or enumerate our dependencies anywhere. How does that work? All of this is thanks to the, thanks to the new state-of-the-art auto-tracking system. Whenever you reference component arguments in your template, Ember is now able to keep track of the dependencies automatically, so we know when to update the output. This works consistently whether you're referencing them directly in the template or when you're referencing them in JavaScript or when you reference them through um, a getter or a getter calling another getter, a getter calling other functions, etc. As far as Ember can tell, all of this just works the same way and Ember is able to follow through the, change of the chain of dependencies without any issues. This capability is not unique to component arguments. Your own code can participate in the auto-tracking system too. All you have to do is add an add track annotation to any property you want to use in the template and you're good to go. Here, for example, we have a rental image component with an as lar is large property on it, uh, indicating whether we're displaying the image in the extended format or not. When the value of this property changes for any reason, Ember will take note of that and re-render the template accordingly. Of course, just like with arguments, this works just as well when you reference them directly in the template or when you access them through a network of getters, external functions, etc. It works all the same way as far as Ember is concerned. So far, we have been focusing on components, but it doesn't stop here. As I mentioned earlier, helpers can also fully participate in the auto-tracking system as well. In fact, the auto-tracking system and track properties work consistently on any arbitrary JavaScript classes and you don't even have to subclass from any particular framework superclass like Ember Objects. So you can create your own model class and it will put a track property on it and it will, it will work just fine. This allows you to implement your business logic in their own little self-contained model and utility classes and then you can just lightly glue them together in your component. More importantly, the auto-tracking system allows us to, ex uh, to refactor existing push-based data flow based on observers and arguments diffing into on-demand pull-based computations. Refactoring existing code to fully take advantage of this new program model can probably be in a talk on its own, which I don't have time for. But you can look forward to future blog posts on this topic, and I suggest you to experiment that on your own as well and share what you've learned with the community. If you want to understand how the auto-tracking system works un under the hood, you can look forward to Chris Garrett's talk tomorrow in which he will show you the nitty-gritty of the system and how it compares to other framework. So check that out. Okay, so we have talked about templates. We talked about how to integrate JavaScript state into templates. And so the last piece of puzzle here is how to work with the DOM. Of course, for the most part, managing the DOM is not something that you have to do explicitly. As you saw earlier, when using templates, Ember will take care of updating the DOM um, whenever your data changes in the JavaScript world. However, when it comes to user interaction, you often want to work with the DOM directly. So here is a couple of examples. Here we're back to the same expandable image example that we saw earlier. We have wire up the is large track property, but we don't have any way for the end user to toggle its value at the moment. 
What we want to do is to call the toggle size method on the component instance whenever the user click on the button. In Octane, we've made this pretty straightforward. First, we'll import the action decorator and annotate the toggle size method as an action. This turns it into a callback that we can use in the template. Next, we will add the built-in on modifier to the elements that we're interested in. In this case, we, speci we specified that we want Ember to call the toggle size method on our component instance whenever either of the buttons are clicked. With that, the user can now click on the image to toggle its size. Um, the thing that we added to the template here is called an element modifier, or modifier in short. It looks like the placeholder syntax that we're used to, but it's attached to a particular HTML element in the same position where attributes usually go. The built-in on modifier allows you to attach event handlers to HTML elements, but the concept of element modifiers is more general than that. In Octane, this is how you interact with the DOM. And just like helpers and components, you can write your own element modifier in your app. Let's look at an, uh, lo let's look at an example for that. Um, here we're back to the index page of our app and there's a search input box on the page. Perhaps you might want it to be automatically focused whenever this page is rendered. Knowing what you know about HTML, you might be tempted to put the autofocus attribute on the input element like that. Unfortunately, the autofocus attribute is really designed for server rendered static pages, so it only works on the initial page load. Since we're rendering content with JavaScript, it doesn't do anything for us. No problem though, we can write a modifier for that. We created a file called autofocus.js inside the modifiers directory. Inside the file, we wrote a small class that inherits from the modifier class provided by the Ember modifier package. Here we have access to the element. In this case, it will be our input element. And whenever the autofocus modifier is attached to an element, Ember will call the will will call the focus method on the element to make it the active element on the page. We think Ember uh, we think element modifiers in Ember are a powerful and pretty intuitive way to work with the DOM. Just like components and helpers, they can be packaged up into reusable add-ons and we look forward to the community finding and sharing new innovative use cases for them um, with the wider ecosystem. And in fact, some of this is already happening. Let's look at two more examples. The first example uses the official render modifiers add-on and just like Jen showed us in the trailer, we want to integrate with the external D3 library in this case. The bulk of the code here comes from a D3 example that we found online and we're able to mostly just paste in the code verbatim. I don't expect you to read all the code here on the slide, um, but the important thing here is that the render modifier add-on provides a convenient way for us to run a callback function on a component whenever a particular element is rendered, which is exactly what we need in this case. And here we have another example. Um, here we have a video player component which consists of an HTML video element and a play button. What we want to do here is for the user to be able to click the play button and it should start playing the video. Um, in order to do that, our play method needs to have access to a video element, but how are we gonna do that? Well, this is where the Ember ref modifier add-on comes into play. It's a perfect use case for it. Um, here we'll add the ref modifier on the video element. Um, this gives us access to the element in our component using the name we chose. In, in this case, it will be this.videoElement. This allows us to finish implementing our play method and with that, our user can now click the play button and start playing our cat video. That concludes our brief journey into Ember Octane. I hope you agree with me that it is an incredibly intuitive and productive programming model. And if you have been using Ember for a long time, this feels pretty different from the framework that you once learned in the best possible way. I only had time for a few selected highlights, but most of these examples are taken directly from the official guides and tutorial. 
They've been completely rewritten for Octane, and I think they're pretty good. I encourage you to give them a read, and I think you'll be surprised. Before we wrap up, I want to talk to you about what comes next. So here comes the part where I spill all the beans on the super secret things that we have been working on. Actually, there's no secrets. In fact, we have a roadmap RC publicly on GitHub. It's been up for a couple of months at this point. Um, the roadmap is set based on the results from last year's community survey and a public call for blog posts that you can participate in. The steering committee then take all of these feedback and come up with a couple of general directions. And you can read more about it in the roadmap, roadmap RFC itself, but here is a quick summary. First, we're going to invest further into the foundation that we built with Octane. We'll keep simplifying things, removing conceptual complexity, and introducing new functionality that complements the new programming model. We are also going to invest in developer tools like making TypeScript and IDE work better with Ember in general, but also with the new features in Octane. Second, we're going to invest in modernizing our build system. You might have heard of an effort called Embrodia, which is going to integrate Ember CLI with popular packagers like Webpack and Rollup. This doesn't mean you have to now change your career into a configuration architect. Rather, these systems will be used under the hood to give you access to modern optimizations like tree shaking and code splitting. Um, on, on the other hand, it will still allow Ember to provide a zero config experience out of the box, so that's pretty nice. Third, we'll invest in Ember, um, making Ember work better with assistive technologies out of the box. We formed a new accessibility strike team to tackle these issues, and if this is something you're interested in helping, you can find them on Discord. Finally, with Octane out the door, um, this is a great time to share Ember with the outside community. This is something that you can help with by writing blog posts, videos, uh, posting on social media, speaking at virtual conferences, or even just teaching Ember to your friends and colleagues. As I mentioned, one of the priorities on the roadmap is to invest in the Octane program model. And given that I spent a lot of time in this session to tell you about how great templates are and why you don't need as much JavaScript anymore, the title of Matthew's talk might surprise you. I won't spoil everything for you, but stay tuned for this session later if you want a glimpse of the future. And since we're talking about the roadmap and talks, Edward is the main architect behind the Embroidia project. He doesn't have a talk at the conference this time, but he spoke about it at Emberfest 2019 with a talk titled Compiling Ember. It's available on YouTube, and if you want to learn more about Embroidia, this is definitely something you should add to your playlist after the, to check out after the conference. Finally, I would like to talk about how you can get um, to be part of this effort. We are a community-driven open source framework, and we rely on the community members like you and me to help move us forward. So first, um, I recommend that you get involved with the community by subscribing to the Ember Times newsletter and joining our Discord server if you haven't already done so. Um, there you can help answer questions, you can bounce ideas, you can ask questions, you can join strike teams, um, etc. Secondly, you can help by giving feedback. Um, what I mean by that? Well, there are a couple of ways you can do that. Maybe you can configure your CI server to run your tests against uh, the beta and canary channel using Ember Try and report any issues as soon as you see them. The earlier we hear about breakages, the easier it would be for us to track them down and fixing them. And of course, you can submit pull requests uh, as well as writing and reviewing RFCs. Third, you can share common solutions you found with the wider community in the form of add-ons, or you can help build better developer experience by contributing to tools like code mods and linters. Um, if you're looking to get started here, check out the Adopted Ember Add-ons project on GitHub. And uh, speaking of tooling, in case you missed it, both Ember Inspector and Ember Total has been updated to work with Octane and the latest version of Ember. Those are great projects to contribute as well. Um, finally, you can help with teaching Ember to more people. As I mentioned before, your blog posts and conference talks are a great place to start, um, but you can also contribute to the official guides and documentation that I mentioned earlier. With Octane, we have invested pretty heavily in the area of learning materials, um, including writing 
our own state-of-the-art tooling to go with the documentation. We now have, for example, a self-updating tutorial that runs itself against the latest changes every day, which um, is great for keeping it up to date and fresh, but it also serves as a good uh, way for us to detect breakages across the ecosystem. If this is something that you would like to um, help with, we would love to get we we'll love to keep the Octane momentum going, so definitely get in touch with Discord on the Deaf Learning channel. And um, finally, if you want to hear more about more ideas about contributing, you can look forward to this session tomorrow. And finally, finally, if you haven't seen the Ember documentation, uh, the <laughs> Ember documentary yet, I highly recommend watching it. It's really well done, and it's available for free on YouTube. There are many highlights, but one of the things that really jumped out to me is this quote from Melanie when interviewed about the core values of Ember. I think this is a great way to sum everything up, so I'm just gonna leave that with you. We are Ember, the Together Framework. Let's get the message out there. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, I hope you are enjoying this morning's live stream. A uh, million mountains had to be moved to get this all to happen and uh, I'm glad we're a couple hours in and nothing has exploded yet. Um, I hope you're all on your companion app, um, which I have right here and I have been really enjoying seeing all of your workspaces and your kids and your dogs and everything and it's really um, helping take the place a little bit of some of that in-person stuff. Um, I want to call attention to, well, the app right now is probably gonna switch to the post-talk survey, but I wanna call attention to the schedule tab for you guys um, and say I'm gonna be trying to update it on the fly as we have more real-time timestamps and all that uh, for a lot of reasons, bathroom breaks, um, pace, all that, but also because you may have noticed that we have some kids' content this year. Um, so typically we have on-site childcare for people who need that for the conference. Um, and basically it's one of the many things that we do to try and remind people that we care about them as whole people, not just the teeny tiny programming um, parts of their brain that are all about Ember. Um, and also because it turns out uh, real life still exists whether or not you acknowledge it. Uh, so this year obviously we couldn't do childcare um, in that way, but we know a lot of you are stuck at home with your little kids whose schools may have been closed and who are probably already, even though we're just getting started, already feeling a little bit of cabin fever. Uh, so I hustled and talked to some of our favorite folks that entertain um, my child, and we're gonna share some of that with you. Uh, the two main folks that you're gonna hear from throughout today and tomorrow, um, the first one is a woman named Kayla, and she works for an organization called Music Together. And Music Together has chapters all over the country and all over the world, I think. Um, and it is one of the ways that you can give your children a real appreciation for music. Um, it's also a really fantastic like learning experience for them. It's also a really good group family activity. Um, they have them like once a week, you'll go to a place and there'll be 10 families with 10 kids of varying ages and a lead instructor and they'll play music and they give you the music to take home. Um, if it's not something you know about and you have a kid, I absolutely encourage you to check out Music Together. Um, our Jonas, who you've all know now, has been going since he was about uh, six months or so. Um, and he loves it. Uh, and Kayla just happens to be our favorite Music Together teacher and she scrambled to get this content together for all of you. Um, so if you look at the schedule, you should be able to tell your um, kiddos roughly when they can come back and join you um, or tell their childcare provider when to bring them back. Um, and Kayla, if you are gonna be here for those sessions, try and get your kiddos to bring along uh, a stuffed animal or two that they like, um, a sock, just one is fine and some train tracks if you have them with trains and some colored paper. It doesn't matter if you don't have it all, it doesn't matter if you don't have any of it, but if they do have it, and these are relatively standard things, so a lot of them might, um, they can bring it along and make them feel a little bit more interactive when they're watching the music together sessions. The other thing that's gonna be sprinkled throughout the day is uh, story time 
from the wonderful folks at Kid Time Storytime. Uh, we've posted some links in the materials tab of your app, so you can go check out Music Together, you can go check out Storytime. Um, the book we're gonna read this morning is called Georgia's Terrific Colorific Adventure, uh, which is a favorite of Jonas's. Um, and then we've got three other fabulous books picked out for the other uh, breaks. Um, this morning, because we got off to a little bit of a late start, we've been go, go, going with no like dead air kinds of breaks. Uh, as we get to the afternoon, um, we'll be able to put in a little more because apparently some of you have to go to the bathroom, eh, whatever. <laughs> um, so the schedule up until lunch right now is pretty spot on in terms of like the exact minutes and things that people are gonna be on. Um, the first story time is gonna happen when lunch, when we break for lunch at noon. So if you don't have kids, um, you're, welcome, you're welcome to listen in anyway, but otherwise you get an hour and a half lunch break. Um, and I hope that it gives you enough time to recharge, get some stretches in. We did have a trainer booked who was gonna come in and do some morning stretches with us, but uh, unfortunately she was in a car accident yesterday. Um, she's okay, but her car is smashed to bits and she's pretty sore. Um, so sorry about that and get well soon, Haley. Um, yeah, okay, so with that, we're gonna launch into our first Music Together session. Actually, one more thing I wanna say. Another reason I wanted to do this content is um, obviously with all the stuff going on in the world right now, um, small businesses are hurting. Uh, everybody's staying inside, they're not spending their money, they're not going to visit all the little places around the, um, around the town that they normally would. And the most innovative among them are trying to adapt really quickly and bring things online, but even that, a lot of them like don't know how to monetize their content yet. Um, and there's gonna be a very steep learning curve right now. Uh, and hopefully the quarantine type things don't last that long, but honestly like a month or two or even a couple of weeks of no revenue are really enough to put a lot of these small businesses out of business. So patronize your small businesses around you, uh, buy gift cards if you can, that'll help keep the cash flow moving, uh, even if you can't spend them right now, though don't all go to the restaurants and shops the first day you can because then they'll drown. Um, and for folks like Kayla at Music Together and Eileen at Kitime Storytime, uh, keep an eye on their websites, find their donate buttons, support them, and uh, do whatever you can to contribute to their livelihood in this tough time. Uh, we do have an open collective um, posted around in Discord and on the website for uh, funds earmarked for our speakers to help reimburse them for money they may be lost on their travel, to help give them some compensation, like on Raria and stuff. Um, if you'd like, you can also put a comment in um, and we will specifically take out specific funds for the children's content providers. So if you wanna send a tip to Kayla, if you wanna send a tip to Eileen, anything like that, um, just put it in your comment when you do an open collective donation um, and then we will pass it along to them and hopefully do our part. We will also post the links to their websites again in the materials tab. Um, watch their videos. Uh, there's some YouTube rev ad revenue in it for them obviously. Share it with your friends and um, I hope you enjoy this little opportunity to get your kids involved in something that you're hopefully enjoying and immersed in. So uh, we'll hear from Kayla. It'll be, I think it's like a 12 minute class or so. Um, and then, oh, it's not lunch right after, I'm wrong. And then we'll go into Sergio's talk uh, about fast flood. Um, okay, thanks everybody. Hi everybody, my name's Kayla and I'm a music therapist. I'm also an early childhood music specialist and I run a program called Music Together Beaverton. Um, and I'm here in the Portland, Oregon area and today we're gonna do some music together, okay? So if your kids are nearby, go grab them. Now's the time that you can have them with you. And uh, we're gonna need um, a laundry basket today. So if you have a laundry basket nearby, grab that. We're gonna be using a sock, so a fun sock of some sort and a stuffed animal if you have a stuffed animal nearby. Go grab that, and we're gonna have some music time for the next little bit, okay?
right? You have your stuffed animal. You want quickly to sing hello to the stuffed animal. So glad to see you. All right, I brought my friend Jack today. This is Jack. Do you have your friend Jack too? Can you put Jack in a box? Like this, okay. Jack in the box, still as a mouse, deep down inside his little dark house. Jack in the box, resting so still, will you come out? Yes, I will! Hey, Jack. Did your Jack come out of the box too? Let's put him right back in, ready? Jack in the box, still as a mouse, deep down inside his little dark house. Jack in the box, resting so still, will you come out? Yes, I will! Okay, so grab that sock. Did you, did you get a sock from earlier? We're gonna put Jack in a sock. Okay, here's Jack. Let's put him in. Are you ready? Jack in the sock, still as a mouse, deep down inside his little dark house. Jack in the sock, resting so still. Will you come out? Yes, I will! Fine, let's do it one more time, okay? Put that sock on, Jack. Here we go. Jack in the box, still as a mouse, deep down inside his little dark house. Jack in the sock, resting so still. Let's ask him, will you come out? Yes, I will. So you can make music out of anything, really, in your house, and a sock is one of them. A laundry basket is another one of them. So now you are gonna become Jack. I'm gonna become Jack too, okay? We're gonna put Jack in a box. Do you have him ready? Jack in the box, still as a mouse, deep down inside his little dark house. Jack in the box, resting so still, will you come out? Yes, I will! Can we try it one more time? Okay, put yourself back in the box. Cause we are now Jack. <gasps> Jack in the box, still as a mouse, deep down inside his little dark house. Jack in the box, resting so still. Will you come out? Yes, I will. Now, parents, grownups, I'm sure you know that laundry baskets can be used for all sorts of things, musical and non-musical things at your house. So that may be getting a lot of use in the coming days and weeks. So get your little one on your lap. We're gonna go for a ride in the car, okay? I'm gonna take one of my friends and take him for a ride in the car too, okay? That sounds like a good note, okay? Do you have them on your lap, okay? So the first thing we do when we get in our cars is we buckle our seat belts, okay? My seat belt looks like this, click. Okay, your kids' seatbelt might look like this. Click, 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 click. Okay, are we all ready? Get your keys or your button, however you turn on your car, okay? Vroom, vroom, I think we're ready. Zoom, zoom, right in the car. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Zoom, zoom, right in the car. We're going out today. Vroom, vroom, driving in the car. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Vroom. Room, driving in the car, we're going out today. Turn, turn, turn in the car. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Turn, turn, turning in the car. You better hold on today. Whoa, turn, turn, turning in the car. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Turn, turn, turning in the car. You better hold on today. Screech, stopping in the car. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Screech. Stopping in the car, you better watch out today. Screech! Stopping in the car, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Screech! Stopping in the car, you better watch out today. A beep 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 honk 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 what else do we like to do in the car i like to sing in the car should we sing in the car sing sing singing in the car la 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 sing sing singing in the car la 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 what else do you like to do in the car 
eat, take a nap. Let's do eating, okay? Here we go. Eat, eat, eating in the car. Yum, 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 yum. Eat, eat, eating in the car. A yum, 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 yum. Oh, sleep too, ready? Sleep, sleep, sleeping in the car. Ah, sleep, sleep, sleeping in the car. We're going home today. Wake up, beep, 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 beep. Wake up, wake up. Ah. Thanks for going for a ride in the car with me today. Okay, we're gonna do one more song today for our time together. And it's one that I'm sure you all know, okay? Let me get my note. And all you need is your fingers for this one, okay? So get your fingers ready. The eensy weensy spider went up the water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the eensy weensy spider went up the spout again. Now I'm gonna put a little music together touch on it, okay? This is how we do it in our classes here. The eensy weensy spider went up the water spout. <laughs> Down came the rain and washed the spider out. <laughs> out came the sun and dried up all the rain. <laughs> and the different type of a spider, okay? What if we made it a great big spider, okay? What would that look like? Hmm. The great big spider went up the water spout. Ready? <laughs> Down came the rain and washed the great spider out. <sighs> out came the sun dried up all the rain and the great big spider went up the spout again how about this one the silly silly spider went up the water spout <laughs> down came the rain and washed the silly spider out oh. out came the sun and dried up all the rain and the silly silly spider went up the spout again <laughs> the sad sad spider went up the water spout ready <laughs> down came the rain and washed the spider out out came the sun and dried up all the rain. <laughs> and the silly, silly spider went up the spout again. <laughs> the happy, happy spider went up the water spout. La, 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 la. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. <sighs> out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the happy, happy spider went up the spout again. La, 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 la. So we can use songs that we already know, right? And make them into anything that is going on in your day, anything that you want to have happen, anything that um, is happening, anything that, um, that you want your child to do. Music really brings us together in lots of different ways. Did you know that Serotonin and oxytocin, those are two chemicals that are released in our bodies. They're like the happy chemicals. Um, it happens when mommies nurse babies. It happens when we eat our favorite food. And it also happens when we make music. Um, so, literally, making music is good for your health, okay? So keep doing that. Make music with your babies. Um, hold them um, close and dance uh, 
dance with them. Um, with your toddler, have a dance party with them. With your big kid, make up new words to songs that you already know, okay? And then you're re releasing oxytocin into your body, okay? I'll see you next time, and we'll make music together again. Bye! It was a really exciting day. But first, let me tell you that the story, all names, characters, and incidents portrayed in these productions are fictitious. No identification with the actual persons, living or deceased, places, building, and products is intended or should be inferred. Just as, as a... It was a really exciting day. But first, let me tell you that the story, all names, characters, and incidents portrayed in these productions are fictitious. No identification with the actual persons, living or deceased, places, building, and products is intended or should be inferred. Just as, as a curiosity, uh, this was started in the film industry after the MGM production Rasputin and the Empress. In that production, uh, it was a film, Rasputin raped Natasha. Natasha was uh, the, the character portraying Prince Irina. And Princess Irina shoot MGM and she won what we would be what it would be today over two million dollars in court and ninety million in out of court settlement. If you are not a native English speaker like I am and I mean I'm not a native sp uh, English speaker, this is legalese for do not sue me please. As I was saying, it was a really exciting day. After months and months of work, we were releasing a, a new feature. The team was really, really excited and thriving because of this. But suddenly, our project manager came with bad news. We were having a leak in, in the server. And I'm not talking about a small leak, I'm talking like this kind of leak. Welcome to Fast Flood, a, massive, a story of a massive memory leak in Fastboot land. My name is Sergio Arbeo. Uh, I'm also known as Serabe in Twitter and GitHub. I work for Dockyard. Dockyard is a digital product consultancy uh, from idea to, to final product. We have QA designers project managers, engineers. If you're looking for some people to, to work with you, just drop us a line and we see what we can, we, we can do. If any of the presents are not familiar with what Fastboot is, Fastboot is the server render engine of Ember. This means that we can render in our server the pages so we can serve and already render pages and let Ember take it from there. If you're not familiar with what a memory leak is, is basically that. It's a piece of data that should have been garbage collected, but it's not for some reason. Let me, let me do a kind of a clearer example with this. Let's say we have variable one, two, three, four, five and six in our memory. And let's say we drop one, two, and three. If after this we still have one, two, three, four, five, and six in memory, we say we have a leak. It could be good that whenever we drop one, two, and three, we find ourselves with one, two, three, four, five, and six in our memory. This means it's reproducible. That's great because it would be easier to debug it. But it's still bad that we have one, two, three drop and still find ourselves one, two, three, four, five, and six. And not just because the, we cannot get rid of one, two, and three. It's just because we don't know what else we can have in our memory. Like, oops, 
a, a, an accessibility soy. That said, I, I hope this makes things much clearer, but why does memory leak happen? The main reason is that something else is keeping a reference. This is almost a hundred percent of cases. There's a tiny, tiny chance, really tiny, that it's a garbage collected book. It usually happens in uh, frameworks themselves. It's really rare to, to see one of these in our applications. As we are talking about references, we can easily create an object memory graph. This is the object memory graph tool in Firefox. We are not going to see much of Firefox here because as we are in Fastboot and Fastboot is Node, it's much easier to work with uh, Chrome developer tools in here. Uh, I don't know for you, but this tool reminds me a lot, uh, the file directory tool uh, in Jurassic Park. And a colleague told me that that was an actual thing in Solaris. But let's see a tool that's much more useful for us. And that's the heap profile. In here, we have two panels. In the panel above, we have all the objects in memory. And then we have uh, information about them. The first piece of information we have is what uh, people call the distance. That's the distance from the GC root. It's uh, a little hard to explain. Uh, it's much easier to, to see written documentation about this. But the general idea behind this is that the biggest the memory leak, the, the smaller this number must be. It's not a, a real correlation, but it's highly likely. And then we have the shallow size. That's the size of the object itself. Finally, we had the retain size. The retain size is the size with free, shall we free that object? Let's see an example of, for example, the object. In this case, we have 400,000, uh, like a 3% of memory in shallow size. But shall we free this object? We would be freeing other values as well. And those would free almost a 30% of the memory. Below this first panel, we have the retainers panel. Uh, we can send objects from this panel to the panel above and vice versa. This is really useful because we can uh, look for a, an object in the panel above and send it to the retainer panel. And we can see which objects are retaining that one. Really, really useful. As I said, this is the heap profile. We can do really good, uh, really cool things with this. Basically, we captured the memory state at one point in time. And the tool let us compare several different uh, profiles. For example, if you work mostly in, the, mostly in the browser, we can do things like this, what we call the three snapshot technique. For doing this technique, the first step is to warm up our, our application. Let's say just start it or start it and logging in would be warming up. This will create a few objects in our memory. After this, we create the first snapshot. After the first snapshot, we do the action we suspect is leaking memory. And we do a second snapshot. As we can see after this action, uh, a few objects has been marked to be recollected. For example, the one in the bottom left corner is marked for recollection. Then we repeat the action and we do a third snapshot. Okay, now we have three snapshots. That's, you might have suspected we would do so because it's called the three snapshot technique. But what can we do with this thing? We can do the following. We want the objects that are in the third snapshot. That removes all the objects marked for recollection or recollected already. Then we want the objects created after the first snapshot. We are not interested in the objects uh, created during the warm up. Maybe if they move now. And finally, we want the objects created before the second snapshot. 
we are not interested in the object created after doing the action for the first time. While this does not pinpoint us to uh, an object that is leaking, this does just reduce a lot the memory we need to inspect. But this is not really useful for us because in fastboot, the memory are, are more atomic. We don't have leaking between requests. For that, it's much more useful the timeline tool. The timeline tool looks exactly like the heap profiler we saw before, but uh, with a timeline above. Let's inspect that timeline. In that timeline, we have uh, a blue bar that represents the memory we are consuming. If some of the part of that memory is being recollected by the garbage collector, that part is displayed as a gray bar. More about the memory in fastboot is that uh, usually in fastboot the warm up action in, involves a higher energy, a higher memory being consumed, but subsequent request does not consume that much. Usually after a few requests, a new application, because that was the, the application, if you remember when we introduced Fastboot, there were like application initializers and instance initializers. It's mostly the same in here. Like we create the application and we create the instances. A new application is created and the other one is dropped. In this scenario, all the requests are leaking almost 90% of the memory. The ideal situation would be something like this. We see all the requests gray. Okay, you'd be wondering, now we have the tools, what? Okay, I'll tell you the process we followed and we refined during, during that uh, story. The step zero is we need to reproduce that locally. Uh, some of you might think might be thinking about using git bisect. Uh, that's a really useful tool if you can use it. In our case, since we were using feature flags uh, extensively, we've been working on that for months, so it, it was not useful for us. In any case, this is useful for anybody. Production is built. Why? Because we want to have the build as close as possible as, as production. That means that uh, we might need to remove uh, some loggers or some services. But if we were using, like, uh, if we were building the Fastboot application and moving it to another project, we would be doing that in here. We want to be as close as possible. And one big change that really needs to be done is no glification. And that's just because the, in the panel we saw before in the, in the heap snapshot profile, uh, the, op the name of the objects would be there. But what if your object has no name, like a simple pojo you were passing? Well, we have a, a, a snippet for that later. The next step would be look for the leak in our code or look for changes between versions. We can approach this like, okay, we have just rece received the, the the, the project in one state, let's inspect the project as it is now, or look for the changes uh, that happen in those months. For finding the leak, uh, we follow the, uh, uh, this process. The first one is running the server. Uh, don't forget to use inspect on inspect brk uh, so you can use the Chrome developer tools with your node instance. Then we do one request. This this idea was taken directly from the free snapshot technique. And also, we do this first request manually. This is important because sometimes you don't uh, solve the, the memory leak but break the build. And that would let you see if you are still uh, returning a, a website. Then you start the timeline and finally make a few requests so you can inspect the code. For making those few requests, we usually use Apache Benchmark, the AV tool, uh, with concurrency one, so you can see more clearly each of those requests. This is the, the, the snippet. Uh, so you can see in, 
while inspecting the memory uh, the the name of some pojos you can use this snippet this snippet that just would let you see that pojo as leak detect in the inspector and look for it or this other one they have the same effect if you need several names just change the leak detect for the name you want foo bar macarena whatever Then we have step two. We need to find the dominator. Dominator is the, a term in the industry. I haven't found uh, other one. If you know of a better one, let me know and I'll change the presentation. But the dominator is basically the retainer we need to remove so the leak is gone. Or we can also find the dependency because the, the, the leak can be, uh, can be in, in one of our dependencies updated during this time. Step three, remove the, the dominator or uh, change the dependency version and win. Thank you so much. Wait, this was not that simple in our case. We were dealing with two big problems. First, we were a fully remote team. There were four people on our team and I think there were even four time zones. And we were leaking the container. If you are new to Ember, container is basically the registry uh, Ember is using for everything. Everything is the, in there. So that's the reason we were leaking almost 90% of our memory. So what do we do? Well, after confirming we were leaking the container, that was on the very first day, we have two approaches. The first one is look for owner leaking. Owner is basically the public API of the container. So we might be looking the maybe leaking the container something somewhere. Might be our code or some of our dependencies. And also update to late December. We were not in the late December because of reasons I cannot disclose, but that's the, the other approach. Maybe hopefully, sorry for the Ember core team, but Hopefully the, the leak was there and it was not our fault. Spoiler alert, we don't know. Then we assign tasks based on people's knowledge. For example, there were one person on our team that had updated a similar application. So we asked him to, to start working on that, update uh, our Ember.js. The other person was the main person behind the changes, behind this new feature. So we charge him with going through the changes and see what could be wrong. And two of us had more experience uh, finding leaks uh, and inspecting memory. So we charge those people on doing a general investigation, on approaching this as if you were new to the project. Done this, I cannot uh, suggest enough that communication is key. Uh, communicate early and communicate often. This is just, uh, if in a remote environment, communication is really, really important. In times of crisis, it is more. Early and often let, let us uh, prevent duplicates of, of efforts in different tasks. And also use your colleagues as rubber ducks. Uh, even if you think you might be use, uh, wasting your times, the times of the time of your colleague, this is not the case because this is a time-consuming task that consumes also a lot of morale, and you really need that human contact as well. Take small victories before winning the war is one of the mm -hmm. other key concepts I, I want you to take from this talk. First, finding the leak won't be done by one individual. As we were splitting the task, uh, the responsibility shall not be split. Why? Because the only reason one person in that team is finding the leak is because the rest of the team is trying other approaches. This is really important. This is not a competition. This is a team effort. But why taking small victories before uh, finding the leak? First, and more important, morale. Uh, while going through this process, even if it's just a few days, they will be a really intensive days that will take on your morale. But why these small victories affect them and 
and lifts your morale? Well, it decreases the pressure. If you consume less memory, you need to restart the server less and you get less pressure from, from the external uh, services. Also, it improves your code base. Less memory consumption, snap your apps. And less memory consumption, you need to inspect less memory to find the leak. And that's nice, that affects morale as well. If you need to inspect, le inspect less memory, it's easier to find it, at least in theory. But please don't take victories at any price. Some, some improvements, improvements are not worth it. Think uh, that you might make a change that will need to be taken into account for the foreseeable future every time you, you do something. Those changes need to be easy to drop in case you want to drop them and doesn't need to be hard to maintain. For example, uh, one of the small victories we took is that we were using presenters in, in our templates. And we stopped catching those presenters in fast boot line. There was four or five lines of code for that and they were easy to remove in case we wanted to. And that uh, removed the, the memory consumption by 30%. And that's nice. But four days later, we were still in the same point. We were consuming much less memory, almost half of it. That's nice, of course. But we were still leaking like 40, 50% of our original memory. What can we do now? This is hard to, to, to describe because we were out of options. Okay, then we thought, this is basically the request in Emberland. A request, if you're not familiar with this in Fastbootland, you just get that request. It goes through several middlewares because Fastboot is basically a, a, an express middleware. Then hits Fastboot, Fastboot goes to the router, the router creates the routes, the routes loads the, the data from data store. Then the, it initializes the controller and the controller uh, renders the template that uses several components to be rendered. This is a simplified version and really inaccurate, but I think it's useful for, for our purpose. So the first thing we did, and, did the, and we did this early, like the first day or the second one, is to check if it's something in our other middlewares because we were using several of them. What we did is substitute fastboot with a static response and the leak was gone. So that means that it's actually in our Ember application. After that, what we thought was the weakest point we can attack and easily change for a static response. That's simple, the template. What we would do is we would remove the template uh, and just use a static HTML receipt from the server. We did this the leak was still there. That means the leak was not in our templates or any of the components below it. Next place, we would replace the model in the route and we would return a plain old JavaScript object. We did that and bingo, the memory leak was gone. So we knew the problem was in the store. We had a really, really custom store adapter and serializers. So that was bad news. The good news is that we were using those customized adapters and serializers for really long. So we were fairly uh, confident on, on not being there, our, our memory leak. What we did is at this point in time, we spent a couple of days uh, replacing parts of Ember data and our adapters for static responses. This is not as simple as it sounds because depending on the point, we might need to tweak different things. But after a couple of days, we found the problem was in our adapter. Do you want to see the problem? The leak was here. And we have in, the, in our adapter, we have a uh, computed property for headers. This is using the, the old uh, syntax because this happened uh, almost a year ago. 
And in these headers, we were returning an authorization with a token injected from one add-on. Do you want to see the fix? Because this is going to be really nice. The fix was this one. Headers was just a getter. But why was that happening? We suspect that something was happening in the request because the, all the properties in the request are being like uh, lazy, like uh, computed at the last moment. And I th we think that's a combination of that and how the value in the bear was injected. But we don't really know. So my last advice for uh, last advice for this would be let go. If it's hard to reproduce, you won't be able to send uh, uh, a reproduction to the Ember team so they can find out. And maybe it's over your level of knowledge. Maybe it's over any of your team's level of knowledge and you cannot really find it. You can spend some time on it, but don't sweat over it. Thank you all uh, for attending my talk on this remote version of EmberConf. It's been a pleasure talking to you at least virtually. If you have any question, I don't know if there will be any system in place for doing that live, but you can reach me on Twitter at Serave. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm really happy and proud that Intercom again is a sponsor of EmberConf. We took a bet on Ember in 2014, six years ago, almost to the day. Back then, we were a small and scrappy startup with big ambitions. Day by day, week by week, month by month, we shipped feature after feature after feature. And these were features that our customers love. And as a result, our company has grown rapidly and continuously. And Ember, for its part, has made this really easy. We try to be deliberate in everything we do. When it comes to Ember, we follow the conventions, stay on the happy path and keep our app up to date every six weeks. And where we can, we contribute to the framework and to add-ons and the RFC process. It's the beauty of open source and the communities that surround it. You get back way more than you put in. And this has certainly been the case for Intercom. So I just want to say to you all, the Ember community, thank you. I hope you have a great EmberConf and I'm looking forward to seeing you all in person this time next year. Bye-bye. A very good morning. Hope everyone is doing great. My name is Suchita Doshi and today I'll be taking you through the journey of Amber. But before I do that, let me give you a quick introduction about myself. I work as a senior engineer at LinkedIn and before LinkedIn I worked for many different companies but my very first Amber experience comes from Yahoo back in late 2013. After Yahoo, I worked for Apple where I didn't do Amber stuff but that was not for long. The love for Amber pulled me to LinkedIn and here I am working on a lot of cool Amber stuff. Also when I'm not on my, like working on my computer or I'm not doing any coding related stuff, here are the things that I love. I love playing guitar. Not a pro, but I can still play a little bit. I'm a huge cricket fan. For those who don't know what cricket is, it's a sport which is very similar to baseball and I myself play cricket and it's very famous back in India. Of late, I have this craze of building my own custom mechanical keyboards with new switches and custom keycaps etc. If any of you have any cool ideas, feel free to reach out to me. And I love watching movies. I mean, who doesn't, right? Okay, enough said about me, now we should focus on the main topic. So today's agenda would be something like this. I plan to cover the journey of AmberJS in terms of its versions like version 1.x, 2.x and 3.x. Going forward, I'll be talking about Amber Octane and its native concepts like some core concepts like native classes, Glimmer components, templating and Octane track properties, modifiers and decorators. After that, I'll be showing you a consolidated comparison 
of the classic syntax versus octane syntax and at the end i will leave you guys with some documentation and references to migration guides and some information about amber octane blogs etc okay so let's start with the journey of amber but before that let's take a step back and think about uh, around in 2013 times or so back in that time we didn't have a lot of options in relation to javascript frameworks as we have today the most evident options during that time were backbone js angular js knockout js etc while these were great they still left the decisions of configuration on the developers it was during that time when one framework emerged which was built on the principle of the developers should not care about the configuration stuff they should only focus on app specific stuff which means the developers productivity would be increased because the framework would do the config related stuff the name of this framework was amber js amber has come a very long way ever since 2013 and let's see how it started with 1.x so since 1.x was the for very first version of amber it came with a lot of goodness to start off with is convention over configuration this was a whole new mental model shift for any developer who comes from a different javascript framework world especially like i will give you my specific example i came from backbone js background and when i started working on amber it was very different for me but as and when i started working on amber i started feeling the difference and i started appreciating it more and more because i started feeling more and more productive so that was when i started falling in love with amber also amber provided inbox built in routing capability so that means you don't have to write your own routing layer or get it from outside or something like that it was already ready for you which was a huge thing also we had support for amber data that took care of the state of the application etc and 1.x was built on view driven architecture what i mean is here you can see the route controller view like that was the path that or that was the architecture that we followed at that time and for anybody who wants a refresher of how we used to write amber views a sneak peek is in here where computed properties were written somewhere like we annotated it with dot property and observers were written something like where we added a dot observes to the properties also we had the capability of two way bindings which was great because at that time it was really really uh, a dynamic thing for any framework to have this ability and we had the support for attribute bindings uh, this was really good because let's say if you had a backing js class for a template like a component with a template or a view with a template and you wanted to associate the attributes value uh, dynamically so with bind atter syntax you can associate your components or views uh, property directly on the template so that was pretty good okay so this was all good amber 1.x was really uh, taking off and it was doing great and uh, complex web applications were starting to love it already but the community always believed that there is always a room for improvement so the lessons that they learned from 1.x and the new frameworks that were evolving during the time when 2.x was being planned out they embraced all of these things together and added things in the road map of 2.x so here are the few things that landed in uh, 2.x instead of view driven now we are component driven uh, this was because the web community itself was going in that direction and amber was hand in hand with that so here you can see route controller component is a new way and again a sneak peek of how the syntax changed the computed uh, property is now amber dot computed and observer is now amber dot observer also we had the glimmer rendering engine in 2.x which was a very very good thing because it gave a dramatic improvement in the re rendering of the application it was pretty good and then we had better binding uh, attributes like you remember in the previous uh, slide 
I showed you the bind data syntax, like you can see here as well in one dot x. But this posed some uh, issues where it became an overhead and it was confusing and so on. With two dot x, it became more simplified, where you can directly add a property from your JS class onto the template without adding the bind data. So that was nice. Also, the template scoping was improved. Let me show you an example. Here we have 1.x and 2.x again, a comparison. And I want to specifically talk about the second uh, example in the 1.x section where we are iterating over the posts without any in. So here I am doing each post and whatever is inside of that iteration loses the outside context or it doesn't have access to the outside context. So you are stuck in that iteration itself. So as a workaround, the above example, like each post in post allowed you to do that where the post would act as the inner context and then you can easily access the outer context. But in 2.x, things were way more simplified and standardized where uh, every time you want to iterate over uh, a property, you use the as functionality, like each post as and then pipe and whatever the parameter is here, it is post. So again, the post would be the inner context and you can get the outer context as and when you wish. Also, while two-way bindings was great, it did impose some uh, issues when your app started becoming more and more complex and more and more bigger. By that, what I mean is, let's say, property A updates B, B updates C, C updates A again. So this kind of infinite cascading started becoming a problem. And that's why we started embracing the data down actions up approach. And Amber 2.x was not just about all of this. It was way more than that. Um, in 2.x itself, we had a roadmap towards things like HTML syntax for component invocation, routes to drive components. Like these are angle bracket invo invocations and routable con components if you might have heard already. That brings me to my next topic, which is Amber 3.x. This is very exciting. It has a lot of things. I'll mention a few of the things here, but there are many more things than this uh, in 3.x. To start off with, it's clean up, clean up, clean up. Why am I emphasizing on clean up so much? Because a lot of clean up has been done uh, with this version, uh, where a lot of private APIs, deprecations, every, everything has been cleaned up. In that way, the code, the framework becomes more manageable, maintainable, and more cleaner. Also, we have removed support for Internet Explorer 9, IE 10, Phantom JS, and also Bower. From now on, the other points, I will be explaining more in details in the coming slides. So I'll quickly skim through these. 3.x has the ability for supporting native classes, Glimmer components, angle brackets invocation, track properties, modifiers and decorators, and lots of documentation, which is a huge thing when you are moving forward with a, such a huge change. So that is a job well done by the folks. So what did we learn? We saw that a framework emerged when, uh, in 2013 and released 1.x, and then it improved more in 2.x, and then it improved even more in 3.x, and then here we are with the first new edition, Amber of Tame. So you must be thinking, why is this a new edition and why is it not a new version? So you can think of an uh, edition as something that uh, represents a shift in programming model due to new features and concepts added in the framework. Like for example, here we have a bundle of new features, a lot of documentation, a lot of toolings like code mods, etc. Everything bundled together. So that's why it's a new addition. So let's take a sneak peek of each or some of the key concepts of Amber Octane itself. Let's start with native classes. So Amber relies very heavily now on native class or native features of JavaScript. When I say it relies on native features, I mean there is very less framework specific code. And because there is very less framework specific code, the overhead on <coughs> building the framework itself is very less. That means increased performance. And 
Amber is known for its steep learning curve. I mean, I've seen many folks who have spoken to and where I've read, uh, I read some blogs as well, where people choose not to use Amber because of its steep learning curve. And I can imagine why. But I think with Octane, that won't be an issue anymore because since now we have, again, I'm repeating, less framework specific code. So you don't have to learn a lot of things out of the box. So it's, it gives you a smooth learning curve experience. Also, because again, the same thing, um, it's more native stuff. It is more aligned with the JavaScript community and you can share code more easily. And there is no more dot gets. Can you imagine like me, myself, personally, I used to feel like, why do we have this? Like this dot get food, this dot get bar. I'm sure a lot of you must be sharing the same feeling like I am right now. So there's no more gets. You just directly do this dot foo, this dot bar, like you usually do to invoke a property in your JavaScript currently. And of course, it is clean and easier to read. Enough said. Let's see an example. So here in this example, you see on the top, we have this classic Amber object in syntax. And at the bottom, we have native syntax. Now, if you see the main difference is how we are creating or defining the object. On the top, we are doing Amber object dot extend. But at the bottom with native class syntax, no more Amber objects. You can just say class person. That's it. You're done. Also, uh, in the classic syntax, you can see the computed property full name is created by passing in the uh, properties first name and last name. And we are invoking the first name and last name as this dot get first name, this dot get last name. Whereas in native class, we are just writing the native getters of JavaScript and then just adding a little splash of uh, computed decorator on top of the native getter. That's it, you are done. You don't have to do this dot gets anyone. This dot first name, this dot last name. So that's pretty cool. This was a little bit about native classes. Now let's move on to Glimmer components. In my personal opinion, this is one of the biggest wins in Amber's journey so far because Amber's component library was pretty old and with this new component library, it's a great refresher. Not only does Glimmer components take all the goodness of native classes, but it also makes it more simplified component library in Amber. Let's talk about this following example again. So here, a uh, Glimmer component is defined by importing Glimmer component instead of Amber component, as you can see. And instead of uh, exporting default component.extend like we do usually in our classic syntax, we just do a native class and then extends uh, the Glimmer component. Also, there are now fewer hooks and properties. That is a great thing. Like Previously, we had 13 lifecycle hooks and 29 properties. Now, can you imagine a new person coming and joining working on Amber and you say, hey, if you want to be productive, if you want to start working and make an effect, you need to know 13 lifecycle hooks and 29 properties. That would be immediately daunting and overwhelming for anyone who uh, comes across this. I think with this, with uh, Glimmer components, no more fear because now we only have two lifecycle hooks and three properties. Also, you must be already knowing that every time you create a component in the classic component world, a wrapper is always wrapped around your template. Like for example, here, the number of guests is just a value. But when it renders on a DOM, there'll be a div, or in this case, the, there'll be a label that will be wrapped around it. This might become confusing, and it has actually. I've had many people come to me and ask me, hey, I'm just rendering this template, what is this uh, new div that is being wrapped around it? I'm not even adding it in my template. And then I had to explain them the reason why. But with Glimmer components, it's what you write is what you get or what you see. Here you can see very well in the bottom where I'm wrapping it around with the label tag itself. So I'm not doing anything special in my class. Rather, I'm just writing everything in my template itself. So that is amazing. Also, it's important for us to identify what things are local in our component and what things come from outside. With the classic components, there was no way to do it because as I can see here, this dot number of guests and this dot max guest, they both are this dot and this dot. 
there's no way for you to know which is a current one and which is i mean which is a local one and which is coming from the parent context but if you see in the glimmer component case this dot args dot max guest so i know now for a fact that max guest is coming from somewhere outside so it's from a parent context so that is a great way to identify what is the point of origin for any particular property so this is a little bit about glimmer components for you guys now let's talk about templating in octane now there are a lot of good things that have come in uh, in the world of templating for octane let's start with angle bracket syntax now this angle bracket syntax is a dramatic simplification of api like uh, let's say for example in here in this example we are seeing in classic templating we are invoking the component using the curlies but in octane we are invoking the component using the normal html syntax which is angle bracket so now it's very easy for me to understand which thing is coming or which thing is a component which thing is a helper which thing is a property whereas before it was very hard for me to understand right when i see it from the first go also uh, with angle brackets we have something called as named arguments named arguments are a way where in the previous slides we saw this dot args it is similar to that but in the templating side where it helps you understand where is the origin of your a uh, property coming from for example in here on the top everything has no context whatsoever you don't know where the employee name is coming from you don't know where the employee id is coming from but in the bottom it's very clear like for example the employee id when i'm prefixing it with the at the rate symbol i know that it is coming from an outside context so now i can understand that okay this is a passed in arc and not something local to my javascript class also a good thing to keep in mind is on the left side like uh, like on the classic templating side on the left side we have name emp id and add employee now it's hard to understand whether this thing is a uh, part of the html attribute or is it a part of your component but with octane it's very easy because now everything that is pertinent to your component will be always prefixed with an at the rate like we have right now in here also we have required this in the templates like we have at the rate symbol for something coming from outside we should know what things reside locally in your backing class and that's where this dot employee name becomes very handy before there was no way for me to know but now i do so it's a great way to make things very specific and very concise and very clear so this was a little bit about templating in the octane world now let's move on to track properties my personal favorite the reason being the simplification that it brings on the table but beneath it is very strong let me start by uh, going through the syntax real quick here you can see instead of computed property where i am uh, importing on the top i am importing a track property from uh, glimmer tracking library then any local property that i want to listen to or that i want to depend on i will mark it as track like i'll prefix it as, as track in the track syntax and then the magic happens on the top in classic syntax you can see there is a computed property that is depending on first name and last name whereas at the bottom i'm not doing anything it is a simple plain javascript getter but the magic happens now where any property that is marked as track will make sure that any getter that uses that track property and if there is any chance where the track property changes it will make sure that it recalculates the getter and sends it back to the uh, browser so in a way the functionality or the behavior would be similar to computer but this is way better just imagine when you are writing a huge component class and you have several properties in your class and if you have to depend on few of the properties here and there for multiple computer properties there will be so many computer properties in your class and it will be not very clean but with this you can just mark those or prefix those with track and just write your regular getters that's all so very clean and concise as well also no more sets like in native classes we had no more gets now we have no more sets so no more this dot set foo set bar or for example in here 
this dot set count equals this dot get count no longer all this confusion just do what you regularly do in your javascript this dot count equals this dot count plus one and you are good to go so that's amazing so these are the few things of track properties um, how it works and how it behaves now let's move on to modifiers and decorators so what is a modifier you can think of modifier as functions or classes that are directly applied to the template like it's applied directly to the element itself like you can see in this example on the button tag i'm adding uh, the on modifier itself which is just doing some usual event handling with this dot increment now you must be thinking why do i need to do this i can currently with my did insert element hook i can associate my uh, event listener and i'm all good to go but just think about it you can do that easily with your top level element or your root level element for your component but what about the child elements you could still do it but it will be a bit messy instead of that modifiers allow you to target specific elements so you can go in whichever elements you want to associate things with you can just add the modifiers in there directly and moreover it also cleans up the code for you and it also I mean, cleans up the state and re-registers if any parameters change. So that is a great thing, and they are easy to reuse. So there are a lot of benefits of using modifiers over not using them. Now let's move on to decorators. What is a decorator? Now you can think of decorators as something that enhances the functionality of what it is prefixed on. For example, here you can see the increment function and decrement function has action. Uh, decorator prefixed. Now, just the increment and decrement functions are doing the job of incrementing or decrementing the counter. But with action decorator, it's doing more than that. It understands that oh, now this function is becoming an action handler rather than just being one function. So that's how it enhances the uh, functionality. So it's kind of an abstraction for the developer, but it adds a lot of value. So this was a little bit about modifiers and decorators. Now let's move on to the meat part. Now we will do the comparison between the classic and the obtain syntax. Now here on the left, very very left side, you see there is a custom off label. That's what we are talking about right now. It is invoked using the curlies, like you can see on the bottom, with toggle label, and I'm passing in few uh, arguments. And in the right, you can see the actual implementation of this component. All this is good. This is classic component. You can see a lot of things happening in the component class itself. When I move it to Octane, this is how it looks like. Now the template specific stuff is in template. The component specific stuff is in component. And um, you can see it is invoked using the angle bracket syntax. Let's go through it one by one. So right away you can see that the import is different on the left on the classic side we have component Angular component and on the right side we have Glimmer component. Next we are no longer doing the classic component syntax like on the left we see component dot extend but on the right we see native class uh, syntax and then we are extending from Glimmer component. Then no longer implicit wrappers on the left I am overriding the tag name with label but on the right. If you see at the right bottom, the label element is being enclosed in the template itself. Also, any template specific stuff goes to template itself on the right in octane part, but that's not happening in the classic. We are still doing attribute bindings and class name bindings in the JavaScript class. Also, a few things to note on the left side in the classic syntax, we have a property called is awesome and uh, a label value computed property that depends on that and then we are invoking it using this dot get but on the right instead we are prefixing it with track the is awesome and then we are just using a normal regular getter and no longer this dot get it is just this dot awesome next thing to check is uh, on the left we see that we are depending on a property called value but I don't know really where this value is coming from. But on the right, it's very evident that it's coming from this dot args dot value that means it's coming from parent context. So easy to understand. Also, um, on the left, we can see that we are handling the uh, click handler on the left by writing the click handler in the classic syntax. 
But on the right, we are using the on modifier to make sure we are hitting on the element itself, like registering it and then handling it using the actions decorator. So this was a little sneak peek for you to give you guys the feel of how it was before, how it is now, how simplified and how um, good the separation of logic has happened now. And I hope it gives you a good understanding of what is coming forward. As promised, here are a few reference and guides where um, it would help you to migrate your current existing Amber app to Octane, like with these code mods. We have a lot of code mods in uh, this link that you can follow. Uh, the folks have done a lot of hard work and it is easily seen in there. Um, hopefully this will be a very smooth transition for you guys. Also, if you have any questions about migrations or migration order or something like that, Amber Atlas would be the right place for you to go because it will give you the right amount of information for you to uh, migrate very smoothly. And the rest are a few uh, random information for you to dig down more deep into Octane and its key concepts and deep understanding about each concept. So this was it guys. Um, thank you very much for patiently listening to my talk. And I hope all of you are as excited as I am for Octane. And I'll see you writing Octane right away. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope you're all still there, though probably getting hungry by now. Um, Quick thank you to Julia, Yehuda, Godfrey, Kayla, Sergio, Gavin, Sushita um, for making our morning so wonderful. Uh, as soon as I finish this announcement, we are going to have some story time and break for lunch. So if you don't want to hear a wonderful story, then your lunch break starts now. Bye-bye. Uh, if you do, we're going to read Georgia's terrific, colorific exper experiment, I think. Um, by the fine folks over at Kid Time Storytime. We'll post links to their channel and website in the app. So if your kids love it, which they will, um, there are hundreds more videos of them online telling these and other stories. Uh, and you can support them by clicking on their affiliate links and all such wonderful things. Um, so with that, we're gonna go, oh, also obviously, super huge thank you to our sponsors. Uh, you heard from Gavin a little bit. We'll hear from a couple of other sponsors in little clips throughout the conference. Um, and I know we're rotating some slides with their logos. So make sure to show them some love in Discord, on Twitter, in the universe, by their stuff, work for their companies, etc. Um, and uh, we will see you all again after lunch. Oh, post pictures of your lunch. Okay, bye. <laughs> Welcome to Kid Time Storytime with me and Hootie. Ooh. Do you ever feel like you're different? Ooh. Do you ever feel like maybe you just don't belong? Ooh. 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 Oh, that was a long answer. Do you ever think that maybe in a, in a world full of orange, you're a, a purple banana? Ooh. 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 So does Georgia. Who? Yes, her. Ooh. Yes, I'm going to read her story. Ooh. I think you're going to like it too. This is a fabulous story where the world of art and science collide. But do they have to collide? Maybe a little. But do they meet somewhere? I don't know. We'll see. And Georgia's terrific 
colorific experiment. So this is Georgia. Hey Georgia, how you doing? So cute. She comes from a family of fantastic artists. Oh, I love artistic families. Her mother, her father, her brother, and her grandma leave Georgia in awe of everything they create. Even the family dog has creative ideas. Look at that. Everybody's working on an art project and crafting and even the bone the bone arrangement that the dog has made is very artistic look at that but georgia well georgia is special she dreams of being a scientist from the vastness of the cosmos to the cell structure of animals and plants she is fascinated by science do, do, do. She's blinded with science. Ba -da -bum 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 -bum. Georgia loves studying the works of other famous scientists too. She's captivated by Marie Curie's studies on radio radioactivity. She admires Galileo, Galileo, Galilei's discoveries of gravity. She fawns over Isaac Newton's conclusions about the color spectrum. Oh, as do I. Well, one day, Georgia had bling, an idea. I've read countless studies and handfuls of hypotheses, but I have never created my own unique experiment. If I can do that, I am sure to be a great scientist. Ah, so she's starting to dream big. And by the way, look at this artsy fartsy creative bedroom she has. And there's Diane Fossey, famous scientist on her wall. See, sometimes the artist leaves us little clues all over in the pictures and things that aren't said, but you can see them. Like here, she's got the table of elements and she's got the world globe. And then she has the artistic elements, stuff that probably her, her family has drawn and woven and created. So it's a very artsy room from an artsy family. Need any help? Her mother asks. I can show you how to sketch out your plans. No, thank you. Let me give you a few tips, her father states. I think adding some color could really enhance your scientific findings. That will not be necessary. I don't know, Georgia. You need a pop of visual awesomeness, her brother says. I can show you how to sculpt something amazing. Uh-oh. Everybody's feeling very helpful, but I think the look on Georgia's face says she is tired of other people buttoning. in. Enough! We were right. I don't need any help. I am not an artist. I am a scientist. Science is about proper calculations and not silly imaginative ideas. Fine! Her brother says. Don't be like us. Go ahead with your fancy schmancy calculator books and beakers. Hopefully your experiment doesn't bore you too much. Oh no, not a big argument. Since my science seems to be boring you, I can be found in my science hut alone. Okay, first of all, she has a science hut. How awesome is that? Secondly, I want to go where she's going. This garden is beautiful. I mean, there's a storm coming, but there's a hut. I'm sure there's a roof over it. So with a leap in her step, Georgia packs everything she can and leaves the house. And, and she goes past that beautiful garden and through that really cute gate and she runs into this really cozy looking safe woods. Oh, oh, do we even have to turn the page right now? I'm just gonna, oh, look at that beautiful place. And look, look, there's a fox and woo, woo, an owl and whoo, another owl. And there's Georgia sitting there in this piece. Oh man, I wish I had a science garden like that. Now, oh, Georgia can finally begin her experiment and be a true scientist inside her hut. At first she is having the most extraordinary time. I'm experimenting, I'm experimenting. I'm doing experiments without interference. So she is really, really happy right now and everything is bubbling and there's, oh, it is quite colorful though. It's 
you know, her family did mention something about color and everything in here seems quite colorful and happy and you no, know, like her. But then, uh oh, she has some trouble getting started. Why is that? I, I can study the, the color spectrum, but, but this has been done before. Oh, 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 oh what about how gravity works? No, wait, wait, that, that's been done before too. I, I'll, I'll create my own radioactive material, Georgia says, but oh, that's not original or safe, is it? No, no, I'm really glad that you put the kibosh on the radioactive experiment. Not the best idea, even though she had some safety equipment. Still, best not to go there. Georgia <sighs> sighs. She'll need to come up with her own ideas to create something special. Mm. Georgia has a motivation, but where's the inspiration? How do scientists come up with such amazing experiments? What am I missing? Well, you remember at the dinner table she said she didn't need imagination? I think she's finding out that she does. But then, oh, an idea strikes. Ba, ba, ba. How does my family get creative? She wonders. Georgia tries something new, something that's not from her library. It feels odd for her at first, but with every colorful beaker she fills and each new shape she draws, her excitement grows. What is this? Let's see, she's, she's counting numbers. She's got stars in her eyes, big ideas, big dreams. There's a color wheel. She's looking, she's drawing experiments. It's getting late. There's numbers flying through her head. <gasps> it's morning. It's time to head back home and Georgia, well, she runs back. What? What, what do you want? Says her brother, still obviously nursing that grudge. Rubbing your boring science in her faces, he asks. I want to show you all something. Well, they all looked a little worried, but well, I mean, they figured she was safe in her, in her hut. By the way, how beautiful is the dawn? Wow. Science can be a work of art. Oh, ah, for the beauty and also for the revelation. Oh, what is this work of art? Oh, she's created. Georgia's mom smiles. I bet you can teach us some fun science facts that will help us with our art. And Georgia smiles back. And I bet you can give me some great art tips so that I can invent more beautiful experiments. Oh, that is the most beautiful thing ever. So this is Georgia, the scientist, and her family of fantastic artists. They used to work separately, but now they create sculptures, paintings, and experiments that leave everyone in awe. Even the family dog helps out. Georgia and her family agree that with art and science working in harmony, inspiration never runs dry. Look at that. So they were able to, co to combine the art and the science to create this amazing flask of beauty. Can you imagine being able to do that with your brain in your science hut that's in the beautiful woods just past that fence and that gorgeous garden? You know, like we spend our weekends normally. Georgia terrific colorific experiment. And now you know that even if you're a little bit different from everybody else, whee, 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 whoo, 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 whoo. that's right. You can still all benefit from each other's talents. Whoo, whoo. You said it, Hootie. You want to take us out? Whoo. All right. Hootie wants to thank you for joining us today on this colorific, whoo, whoo, terrific, whoo, whoo, experimental, whoo, 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 whoo. That's right. Kid die story time. <laughs>